Chapter Thirty One of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty One involves a critical position. Who's that? inquired Brittles, opening the door a little way, with the chain up, and peeping out, shading the candle with his hand. Open the door replied a man outside. "'It's the officers from Bow Street. Have we sent two to to-day?' Much comforted by this assurance, Brittles opened the door to its full width, and confronted a portly man in a greatcoat, who walked in, without saying anything more, and wiped his shoes on the mat, as coolly as if he lived there. "'Just send somebody out to relieve my mate, will you, young man?' said the officer. "'He's in the gig, a mind in the prad.' Have you got a court just here, that you could put it up in for five or ten minutes?" Brittles replying in the affirmative, and pointing out to the building, the portly man stepped back to the garden gate, and helped his companion to put up the gig, while Brittles lighted them in a state of great admiration. This done, they returned to the house, and, being shown into a parlour, took off their great coats and hats, and showed like what they were. The man who had knocked at the door, was a stout personage, of middle height, aged about fifty, with shiny black hair, cropped pretty close, half-whiskers, a round face, and sharp eyes. The other was a red-headed, bony man, in top-boots, with a rather ill-favoured countenance, and a turned-up sinister-looking nose. "'Tell your governor that Blathers and Duff is here, will you?' said the stouter man, smoothing down his hair, and laying a pair of handcuffs on the table. Oh! "'Good evening, master. Can I have a word or two with you in private, if you please?' This was addressed to Mr. Losburn, who now made his appearance. That gentleman, motioning Brittles to retire, brought in the two ladies, and shut the door. "'This is the lady of the house,' said Mr. Losburn, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie. Mr. Blathers made a bow. Being desired to sit down, he put his hat on the floor, and, taking a chair, motioned to Duff to do the same. The latter gentleman, who did not appear quite so much accustomed to good society, or quite so much at his ease in it, one of the two, seated himself, after undergoing several muscular affections of the limbs, and the head of his stick into his mouth, with some embarrassment. "'Now, with regard to this here robbery, master,' said Blathers, "'what are the circumstances?' Mr. Losburn, who appeared desirous of gaining time, recounted them at great length, and with much circumlocution. Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked very knowing, meanwhile, and occasionally exchanged a nod. "'I can't say for certain till I see the work, of course,' said Blathers, "'but my opinion at once is—I don't mind committing myself to that extent—that this wasn't done by a yokel, eh, Duff?' "'Certainly not,' replied Duff. "'And translating the word yokel for the benefits of the ladies, I apprehend your meaning to be, that this attempt was not made by a countryman,' said Mr. Losburn, with a smile. "'That's it, master,' replied Blathers. "'This is all about the robbery, is it?' "'All,' replied the doctor. "'Now, what is this about this here boy that the servants are a-talking on?' said Blathers. "'Nothing at all,' replied the doctor. "'One of the frightened servants chose to take it into his head that he had something to do with this attempt to break into the house. But it's nonsense. Sheer absurdity.' "'Were he easy disposed of, if it is,' remarked Duff. "'What he says is quite correct,' observed Blathers, nodding his head in a confirmatory way, and playing carelessly with the handcuffs, as if they were a pair of castanets. "'Who is the boy?' What account does he give of himself? Where did he come from? He didn't drop out of the clouds, did he, master?" "'Of course not,' replied the doctor, with a nervous glance at the two ladies. "'I know his whole history, but we can talk about that presently. You would like, first, to see the place where the thieves made their attempt, I suppose?' "'Certainly,' rejoined Mr. Blathers. "'We had better inspect the premises first, and examine the servants afterwards. That's the usual way of doing business." Lights were then procured, and Messrs. Blathers and Duff 
attended by the native constable, Brittles, Giles, and everybody else in short, went into the little room at the end of the passage, and looked out at the window, and afterwards went round by way of the lawn, and looked in at the window, and after that had a candle handed out to inspect the shutter with, and after that a lantern to trace the footsteps with, and after that a pitchfork to poke the bushes with. This done, amidst the breathless interest of all beholders, they came in again, and Mr. Giles and Brittles were put through a melodramatic representation of their share in the previous night's adventures, which they performed some six times over, contradicting each other in not more than one important respect the first time, and in not more than a dozen the last. This consummation being arrived at, Blathers and Duff cleared the room, and held a long council together, compared with which, for secrecy and solemnity, a consultation of great doctors on the knottiest point in medicine would be mere child's play. Meanwhile the doctor walked up and down the next room, in a very uneasy state, and Mrs. Maylie and Rose looked on with anxious faces. "'Upon my word,' he said, making a halt, after a great number of very rapid turns, "'I hardly know what to do.' "'Surely,' said Rose. The poor child's story, faithfully repeated to these men, will be sufficient to exonerate him. "'I doubt it, my dear young lady,' said the doctor, shaking his head. "'I don't think it would exonerate him, either with them, or with legal functionaries of a higher grade. What is he, after all, they would say? A runaway. Judged by mere worldly considerations and probabilities, his story is a very doubtful one.' "'You believe it, surely?' interrupted Rose. "'I believe it, strange as it is. And perhaps I may be an old fool for doing so,' rejoined the doctor. "'But I don't think it is exactly the tale for a practical police officer, nevertheless.' "'Why not?' demanded Rose. "'Because, my pretty cross-examiner,' replied the doctor, "'because, viewed with their eyes, there are many ugly points about it. He can only prove the parts that look ill, and none of those that look well. Confound the fellows! They will have the why and the wherefore, and will take nothing for granted. On his own showing, you see, he has been the companion of thieves for some time past. He has been carried to a police officer, on a charge of picking a gentleman's pocket. He has been taken away forcibly from that gentleman's house, to a place which he cannot describe or point out, and of the situation of which he has not the remotest idea. He is brought down to Chertsey, by men who seem to have taken a violent fancy to him, whether he will or no, and is put through a window to rob a house. And then, just at the very moment when he is going to alarm the inmates, and so do the very thing that would set him all to rights, there rushes into the way a blundering dog of a half-bred butler, and shoots him, as if on purpose to prevent his doing any good for himself. Don't you see all this?" "'I see it, of course.' replied Rose, smiling at the doctor's impetuosity. But still I do not see anything in it to criminate the poor child." "'No,' replied the doctor, "'of course not. Bless the bright eyes of your sex. They never see, whether for good or bad, more than one side of any question, and that is always the one which first presents itself to them." Having given vent to this result of experience, the doctor put his hands into his pockets, and walked up and down the room with even greater rapidity than before. "'The more I think of it,' said the doctor, "'the more I see that it will occasion endless trouble and difficulty if we put these men in possession of the boy's real story. I am certain it will not be believed, and even if they can do nothing to him in the end, still the dragging it forward and giving publicity to all the doubts that will be cast upon it must interfere materially with your benevolent plan of rescuing him from misery." "'Oh! What is to be done?' cried Rose. "'Dear, dear! Why did they send for these people?' "'Why, indeed!' exclaimed Mrs. Maylie. "'I would not have had them here for the world.' "'All I know is,' said Mr. Losburn, at last, sitting down with a kind of desperate calmness, that we must try and carry it off with a bold face. The object is a good one, and that must be our excuse. The boy has strong symptoms of fever upon him, and is in no condition to be talked to any more. That's one comfort. We must make the best of it, 
and if bad be the best, it is no fault of ours. Come in. Well, master, said Blathers, entering the room followed by his colleague, and making the door fast, before he said any more. This warn't a put-up thing. And what the devil's a put-up thing? demanded the doctor impatiently. We call it a put-up robbery, ladies, said Blathers, turning to them, as if he pitied their ignorance, but had a contempt for the doctors. When the servants is in it. Nobody suspected them in this case, said Mrs. Maylie. Very likely not, ma'am, replied Blathers, but they might have been in it for all that. More likely on that wery account, said Duff. We find it was a town end, said Blathers, continuing his report, for the style of work is first rate. Very pretty indeed it is, remarked Duff in an undertone. There was two of em in it, continued Blathers, and they had a boy with em. That's plain from the size of the window. That's all to be said at present. We'll see this lad that you've got upstairs at once, if you please. Perhaps they will take something to drink first, Mrs. Maylie, said the doctor, his face brightening as if some new thought had occurred to him. Oh, to be sure, exclaimed Rose eagerly. You shall have it immediately, if you will. Why, thank you, miss, said Blathers, drawing his coat-sleeve across his mouth. It's dry work, this sort of duty. Anything that's handy, miss, don't put yourself out of the way on our accounts. What shall it be? asked the doctor, following the young lady to the sideboard. A little drop of spirits, master, if it's all the same, replied Blathers. It's a cold ride from London, ma'am, and I always find the spirits comes home warmer to the feelings. This interesting communication was addressed to Mrs. Maylie, who received it very graciously. While it was being conveyed to her, the doctor slipped out of the room. Ah, said Mr. Blathers, not holding his wine-glass by the stem, but grasping the bottom between the thumb and forefinger of his left hand, and placing it in front of his chest. I have seen a good many pieces of business like this in my time, ladies. That crack down in the back lane at Edmonton, Blathers, said Mr. Duff, assisting his colleague's memory. That was something in this way, warn't it? rejoined Mr. Blathers. That was done by Conky Chickweed, that was. You always gave that to him, replied Duff. It was the family pet, I told you. Conky hadn't any more to do with it than I had. Get out, retorted Mr. Blathers. I know better. Do you mind that time when Conky was robbed of his money, though? What a start that was! <laughs> better than any novel book I ever see. What was that? inquired Rose, anxious to encourage any symptoms of good humour in the unwelcome visitors. It was a robbery, miss, that hardly anybody would have been down upon, said Blathers. This here conky chickweed. Conky means nosy, ma'am, interposed Duff. Of course the lady knows that, don't she? demanded Mr. Blathers. Always interrupting you are, partner. This here conky chickweed, miss, kept a public house over Battlebridge Way, and he had a cellar where a good many young lords went to see cock-fighting and badger-drawing and that, and a very intellectual manner the sports was conducted in, for I seen him often. He warn't one of the family at that time, and one night he was robbed of three hundred and twenty-seven guineas in a canvas bag that was stole out of his bedroom in the dead of night, by a tall man with a black patch over his eye, who had concealed himself under the bed, and after committing the robbery— jumped slap out of the window, which was only a story I. He was very quick about it, but Conky was quick too, for he fired a blunderbuss at him, and roused the neighbourhood. They set up a you and cry directly, and when they came to look about him, found that Conky had hit the robber, for there was traces of blood, all the way to some palings, a good distance off, and there they lost him. However, he made off with the blunt, and consequently, the name of Mr. Chickweed, Licence Whitler, appeared in the Gazette among the other bankrupts, and all manner of benefits and subscriptions, and I don't know what all, was got up for the poor man, who was in a very low state of mind about his loss, and went up and down the streets for three or four days 
of pulling his hair off in such a desperate manner that many people was afraid he might be going to make away with himself. One day he came up to the office, all in a hurry, and had a private interview with the magistrate, who, after a deal of talk, rings the bell, and orders Jem Spires in. Jem was an active officer, and tells him to go and assist Mr. Chickweed in apprehending the man as robbed his house. "'I see him, Spires,' said Chickweed. "'Pass my house yesterday morning. "'Why didn't you up and collar him?' says Spires. "'I was so struck all of a heap that you might have fractured my skull with a toothpick,' says the poor man. "'But we're sure to have him, for between ten and eleven o'clock at night he passed again.' Spires no sooner heard this than he put some clean linen and a comb in his pocket in case he should have to stop a day or two, and away he goes, and sets himself down at one of the public-house windows behind the little red curtain, with his hat on, all ready to bolt out at a moment's notice. He was smoking his pipe here, late at night, when all of a sudden Chickweed roars out, "'Here he is! Stop, thief! Murder!' Jem Spires dashes out and there he sees Chickweed a-tearing down the street full cry. Away goes Spires, on goes Chickweed, round turns the people, everybody roars out thieves, and Chickweed himself keeps on shouting all the time like mad. Spires loses sight of him a minute as he turns a corner, shoots round, sees a little crowd, dives in. Which is the man? Damn me, says Chickweed, I've lost him again. It was a remarkable occurrence, but he warn't to be seen nowhere. So they went back to the public-house. Next morning Spires took his old place, and looked out, from behind the curtain, for a tall man with a black patch over his eye, till his own two eyes ached again. At last he couldn't help shutting him, to ease him a minute, and from the very moment he did so, he hears Chickweed a-roaring out, "'Here he is!' Off he starts once more, with Chickweed halfway down the street ahead of him, and after twice as long a run as the yesterday's one, the man's lost again. This was done once or twice more, till one half the neighbours gave out that Mr. Chickweed had been robbed by the devil, who was playing tricks with him afterwards, and the other half, a poor Mr. Chickweed, had gone mad with grief. "'What did Jem Spires say?' inquired the doctor who had returned to the room shortly after the commencement of the story. "'Jem Spires,' resumed the officer, for a long time said nothing at all, and listened to everything without seeming to, which showed he understood his business. But, one morning, he walked into the bar, and taking out his snuff-box, says, "'Chickweed, I found out who done this here robbery.' "'Have you?' said Chickweed. Oh, my dear Spires, only let me have vengeance, and I shall die contented. Oh, my dear Spires, where is this villain? Come, said Spires, offering him a pinch of snuff. None of that gammon. You did it yourself. So he had, and a good bit of money he had made by it, too, and nobody would never have found it out if he hadn't been so precious anxious to keep up appearances, said Mr. Blathers putting down his wine-glass, and clinking the handcuffs together. "'Very curious, indeed,' observed the doctor. "'Now, if you please, you can walk upstairs.' "'If you please, sir,' returned Mr. Blathers. Closely following Mr. Losburn, the two officers ascended to Oliver's bedroom, Mr. Giles preceding the party with a lighted candle. Oliver had been dozing, but looked worse, and was more feverish than he had appeared yet. Being assisted by the doctor, he managed to sit up in bed for a minute or so, and looked at the strangers without at all understanding what was going forward, in fact, without seeming to recollect where he was, or what had been passing. "'This,' said Mr. Losburn, speaking softly, but with great vehemence, notwithstanding, "'this is the lad who, being accidentally wounded by a spring-gun in some boy's trespass on Mr. what do you call him's ground at the back here, comes to the house for assistance this morning, 
and is immediately laid hold of and maltreated by that ingenious gentleman with the candle in his hand, who has placed his life in considerable danger, as I can professionally certify. Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked at Mr. Giles, as he was thus recommended to their notice. The bewildered butler gazed from them towards Oliver, and from Oliver towards Mr. Losburne, with a most ludicrous mixture of fear and perplexity. "'You don't mean to deny that, I suppose?' said the doctor, laying Oliver gently down again. "'It was all done for the, for the best, sir,' answered Giles. "'I am sure I thought it was the boy, or I, I wouldn't have meddled with him. I am not of an inhuman disposition, sir.' "'Thought it was what boy?' inquired the senior officer. "'The housebreaker's boy, sir,' replied Giles. "'They—' They certainly had a boy. "'Well, do you think so now?' inquired Blathers. "'Think what now?' replied Giles, looking vacantly at his questioner. "'Think it's the same boy, stupid Ed. rejoined Blathers impatiently. "'I don't know. I really don't know,' said Giles, with a rueful countenance. "'I couldn't swear to him.' "'What do you think?' asked Mr. Blathers. "'I—I I don't know what to think,' replied poor Giles. "'I don't think it is the boy. I, indeed, I, I'm almost certain that it isn't. Y you know, it can't be.' "'Has this man been a-drinking, sir?' inquired Blathers, turning to the doctor. "'What a precious muddle-headed chap you are!' said Duff, addressing Mr. Giles with supreme contempt. Mr. Losburn had been feeling the patient's pulse during this short dialogue, but he now rose from the chair by the bedside, and remarked that if the officers had any doubts upon the subject, they would perhaps like to step into the next room, and have brittles before them. Acting upon this suggestion, they adjourned to a neighbouring apartment, where Mr. Brittles, being called in, involved himself and his respected superior, in such a wonderful maze of fresh contradictions and impossibilities, as tended to throw no particular light on anything. But the fact of his own strong mystification, except indeed his declarations that he shouldn't know the real boy, if he were put before him in that instant, that he had only taken Oliver to be he, because Mr. Giles had said he was, and that Mr. Giles had, five minutes previously, admitted in the kitchen that he began to be very much afraid he had been a little too hasty. Among other ingenious surmises, the question was then raised, whether Mr. Giles had really hit anybody, and upon examination of the fellow pistol to that which he had fired, it turned out to have no more destructive loading than gunpowder and brown paper, a discovery which made a considerable impression on everybody but the doctor, who had drawn the ball about ten minutes before. Upon no one, however, did it make a greater impression than on Mr. Giles himself, who, after labouring for some hours under the fear of having mortally wounded a fellow-creature, eagerly caught at this new idea, and favoured it to the utmost. Finally, the officers, without troubling themselves very much about Oliver, left the Chertsey constable in the house, and took up their rest for that night in the town, promising to return the next morning. With the next morning there came a rumour that two men and a boy were in the cage at Kingston, who had been apprehended overnight under suspicious circumstances, and to Kingston, Messrs. Blathers and Duff, journeyed accordingly. The suspicious circumstances, however, resolving themselves, on investigation, into the one fact that they had been discovered sleeping under a haystack, which, although a great crime, is only punishable by imprisonment, and is in the merciful eye of the English law, and its comprehensive love of all the King's subjects, held to be no satisfactory proof, in the absence of all other evidence, that the sleeper, or sleepers, have committed burglary accompanied with violence and have therefore rendered themselves liable to the punishment of death. Messrs. Blathers and Duff came back again, as wise as they went. In short, after some more examination, and a great deal more conversation, a neighbouring magistrate was readily induced to take the joint bail of Mrs. Maylie and Mr. Losburn for Oliver's appearance, if he should ever be called upon. And Blathers and Duff, being rewarded with a couple of guineas, returned to town with divided opinions on the subject of their expedition. 
the latter gentleman, on a mature consideration of all the circumstances, inclining to the belief that the burglarious attempt had originated with the family pet, and the former being equally disposed to concede the full merit of it to the great Mr. Conky Chickweed. Meanwhile, Oliver gradually throve and prospered, under the united care of Mrs. Maylie, Rose, and the kind-hearted Mr. Losburn. If fervent prayers, gushing from hearts overcharged with gratitude, be heard in heaven, and if they be not what prayers are, the blessings which the orphan child called down upon them, sunk into their souls, diffusing peace and happiness. End of chapter 31